In this video, I'm going to introduce the topic of electronegativity. Now, it's really important that you're aware of this topic before you start things like oxidation number and bonding. Now, for the start of the video, I'm going to assume that all bonds are covalent. Now, obviously they're not, but we're going to lead up to how electronegativity is linked to different types of bonding. But for now, we're just going to assume that all bonds are covalent. Okay, so a good place to start is the definition of electronegativity. So that's at the bottom of the screen now. The ability of an atom to attract the bonding electrons in a covalent bond. The attraction is between the nucleus. Obviously, there's protons in the nucleus. That's why we've got positive charge in there and the bonding electrons. Now, you'll notice this diagram that's been on all the slides so far of a tug of war. And I think this is a good way to think about electronegativity. So we've got a bonding pair of electrons there and the nucleus of the atom on the left is obviously attracting these negative electrons and likewise the nucleus of the atom on the right is doing the same. Now you'll notice that I've put different sized positive signs in the nucleus of this character in this character and that's to try and get across the fact that the level of attraction is different. So remember the definition of electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract the bonding pair of electrons in a covalent bond. So different atoms are going to have different levels of attraction. So what causes this level of attraction or what are the factors that could influence the level of attraction? Well the first one we could think about is the number of protons in the nucleus or the nuclear charge it's sometimes called. That's obviously going to influence the strength of this attraction. Another one is the physical distance between the um, nucleus or the protons in the nucleus and the bonding electrons. So that's the atomic radius. And another factor is the amount of shielding from the inner electron shells. So electron shells are going to block or shield the attraction between the nucleus and these bonding electrons. So moving on to this slide now, we've got a 3D periodic table and it's showing the relative electronegativity values of most of the elements on the periodic table. Just apologize for the fact that um, they've got capital letters for the second letter. Obviously these should all be lowercase, but apart from that, it's doing the job that I wanted to. Uh, just to say that the scale that we use to measure electronegativity is called the Pauling scale. And I just want to pick out a, a couple of things, two or three things on this before moving on to the final section. So the first thing I want to talk about is the noble gases. You'll notice that they aren't assigned electronegativity values. And if you think about the reason why they don't need to attract electrons, because they've got a full outer or full valence shell. So the noble gases typically are assigned electronegativity values of zero. The second thing I want to look at is uh, the general, I stress the word general, because if you look very closely, there are slight fluctuations, but the general trend across a period is that the electronegativity increases. So if we think about the factors at play, so if, if we go across a period, you have an extra proton in the nucleus each time. So the nuclear charge is increasing. You've got the same amount of shielding in the same period because you've got the same number of shells. So the knock-on effect of that is it actually lowers the atomic radius. And so therefore the attraction or the nuclear attraction on those bonding electrons is going to increase. And the final trend I want to look at is the general group trend now. So we'll focus on the halogens. It's really clear what's going on there. As you go down the group, the electronegativity decreases. So if we again, think about the factors. You've got an increase in atomic radius because you've got more electrons in the atom. It's physically getting larger. You've got more shielding between the nucleus, the protons in the nucleus, and the valence electrons where those bonding electrons are. Um, despite the extra protons in the nucleus, because obviously bromine's got more protons in its nucleus than chlorine, iodine's got more than bromine, and so on. So despite that increase in nuclear charge, those factors I've already mentioned, 
the um, atomic radius increasing and the shielding increasing, that outweighs the extra proton. And so the knock-on effect of that is the electronegativity decreases. So if we just summarize that now, if you go across the periodic table left to right, electronegativity increases. And if you go down from top to bottom, it decreases. So you can see the highest electronegativity atoms are the ones in the top right hand corner. Now you don't need to know specific electronegativity values, they would always be given in the exam, but it's worth knowing that fluorine is the most electronegative atom. It's also worth knowing the top three are fluorine, oxygen and nitrogen, closely followed by chlorine. And the reason I get my students to remember those three, the fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, is because when you come onto something called hydrogen bonding, it's really, really helpful for that. In the final part of the video, I'm going to link all of this to bonding type. So if you remember at the start of the video, we said that we're assuming that all bonding is covalent. Well, obviously that's not true. So if we just look at how electronegativity links in with bonding type. So if we think about something like hydrogen, and you'll notice, hopefully you can see, We've got, the, we've got the identical atom, both H's, so their electronegativity values are the same, so 2.1 each. So therefore, the attraction between the nucleus of the right-hand hydrogen and the pair of electrons in the bond is exactly the same as the attraction from the left. So both atoms have got the same ability to attract the bonding electrons, and so this is what we call a pure covalent bond. We move on to something like sodium chloride, which we know isn't covalent, but I'm showing, I'm sort of representing it as if it is at the moment. The um, electronegativity value for the sodium is 0 0.9, and for the chlorine it's 3.0. So basically, chlorine has a much greater ability to attract the bonding electrons than the sodium. This is where the tug of war analogy really helps, I think. So basically, the upshot of that is the chlorine gets that pair of electrons or takes control of that pair of electrons. It already owned the, 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 the black circle, okay, but the cross used to belong to the sodium, chlorine's got it now, and so it's actually picked up a negative charge because it's gained an electron, the sodium's lost um, an electron, so it becomes positively charged, so they become ions and they attract each other electrostatically. So this is an ionic bond. So that was because the difference in electronegativity was quite big. So the final example I'm going to look at is hydrogen chloride. So you can see hydrogen there has got an electronegativity value of 2.1 versus chlorine's 3.0. So now there's not a big enough difference in the electronegativity values for one of the atoms, or chlorine in this case, to take control of the bond in electrons. So basically what happens is the electron pair in the bond will be pulled a bit closer to chlorine, so they're still going to share the electrons in the bond, it's just chlorine's got a greater share of the electron density. And the upshot of that is it'll create what's called a polar covalent bond. So it puts what's called a dipole, a charge separation across the bond, that's represented by these delta plus and delta minus signs, this is a dipole, so the hydrogen end of the molecule is slightly positive, whereas the chlorine end of the molecule is slightly negative. So not full charges, not plus and minus, like we had in ionic bonding, but delta plus, delta minus. Okay, so we'll just wrap this up now, summarize what we've said. So you can use electronegativity to predict bond types. So first thing to say is bonds between atoms of different elements are rarely purely ionic or purely covalent. There's a gradual transition from ionic to covalent, so there's not like a magic cutoff point where it's ionic or covalent, it's more of a spectrum really. And we can use electronegativity difference to predict the type of bond between the atoms. So in general, so it's not a hard and fast rule this, but in general, if the difference is about 0.4 or less, so it's a small difference in other words, we say that the bond will be non-polar covalent, or you could call that pure covalent. If the difference is a bit greater, so between 0.4 to 2, 
what we say is the bond will be polar covalent. So there's, they're still sharing the electrons in the bond, but one atom is going to have a greater share of the electrons than the other. And then if the difference goes above two, then the bonding will be mainly ionic.